Isn't it amazing how the Lord does prep us for certain things through a multitude of ways? Nevertheless, when it hits, it's always, uh, well, it's one thing preparing for something. It's another to endure it. It is. And all things are, I tell you, things are really escalating. Right? Which is why, really, we must depart from what we thought was the way to go into the way we should go. Right? You know, the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto man. I'm paraphrasing, but it's not. There's a way that seems right, but it's not the right way. Right? Also, ladies and gentlemen, I may analyze and, and um, because they're going, they're, but things are being pushed in overdrive. Are you guys aware that a brand new set of technological resources are being launched to the world through various uh, companies? Are you aware of that? I'm going to give you an idea of how that's going to take place, right? Most people talk about, uh, we talk about the installment of the Mark of the Beast. Um, we, we have a firm belief here that the Mark of the Beast begins in the soul of man. Right? Begins in the soul of man. <clears throat> but the one scripture where it says he causes all, that's a forceful word. Now, I know a lot of people begin to dispute this, but that's a forceful word. Let me give you an example of that, too. He causes everybody to do this, that, or the other. How can you cause a person to take the mark they don't want, right? How do you cause one to do that? Because it's not a mark you don't want. Prior to that revelation, he wore out the saints of the Most High before the introduction of the mark of the beast, right? We, we have been caused to, to let, let me, let me put it to you this way. Sin is born of mankind. Okay? Sin is. Man gives birth to sin. Are they caused to sin? Hmm? Are they? When you were born, were you born without sin or with sin? So then by your very birth, you were delivered into the sinful world in your flesh, sin in your flesh, right? Your body itself carrying the sins of your parents. Born into sin, you were. What does that mean? Ah, now we're talking about potentials. How you lived your life. Doesn't matter if you didn't, if some of you didn't murder anybody. Right? But the very nature of your flesh yields sin itself. Because one must choose Christ. That's the only way to have life. You were in death prior to life. Death is sin. Sin is death. You were born into sin. Was it pressed upon you? Hmm? Yes, through your forefathers. Sin came into this world through Adam. Everybody after him, or that set of peoples, sin followed. Adam is enough. I know some of you guys are, you're, you're digging, right? You're digging. We have some advanced classes for that. Mankind, sin came through mankind. You're born into a world whose ideologies, ways of life, are sin, and sin itself. When you go to school and you educate yourself, you're taught things against the Ten Commandments. You truly are. School, you are caused to go to school, aren't you? It's, the, you, it's not a volunteer thing. You must go to school. How'd that happen? Laws of the land. What happens if you don't go to school? If your child does not go to school, what is that called? You're going to get a what type of letter will you receive? Truancy. You're in trouble. It is mandatory that your child enter into education. It is forced upon mankind. It is. Do the parents have to send their child to school? No, you don't. You really don't. You really don't. But let me ask you this. Who's going to step up and defy the system all by themselves? Hardly anybody. What do you do when you don't want to step up into it? You can take the court. You can come up with all sorts of reasons why your child should be educated at home. There are laws that support that too. But who's going to go through all that? 
We didn't. Our parents didn't. We went to school anyway, didn't we? Why? Because no one wants to face something like, like that. And it makes it okay that everybody else does it. You can be against your religion. You'll still send them to school. You'll say, well, Sonny, just put it in perspective. You begin to say, well, you need that education, right? To a degree, they do. They do. They have to be educated. Right? But you'll also stand behind the system saying it is necessary. When your kids come home from school, they say things, that, well, you know, they taught us so-and-so. And you know it's not true what they told them. Like Darwinism. If you're totally against Darwinism, and you know it's, a, it's not real to you, then why would you support that of your children? Why? Because everybody else does it. Why do you do that? It is the way of the land. Correct? And when it's the way of the land, somehow we compensate for it. We overlook it. We say, oh, it's okay this time. So long as they know the truth in their hearts, it's okay. Right? Don't we do that? In that same way, don't we, don't we deceive ourselves in a lot of things? No one's going to, well, I can't say no one, hardly anybody's going to take a stance in their convictions, face jail and everything else to make a point for their child. When they begin to think of the consequences of going to jail in the first place, they'll say, well, it's not worth it. God understands. I'm telling you now that the mark of the beast be instituted the same way. In fact, what if I were to say that the Mark of the Beast has been underway for a long time and many people have accepted it? Let me give you an example of that. You all know about the RFID, right? Do you know what happened in 2005? How many know what happened in 2005 through 2007? Anybody know? What? You said it was mandatory in certain governmental agencies to have an RFID chip? Oh, yeah, you were right. In 2007 through 2009, 800,000 employees had the RFID chip implanted. Did you know that? That was 2000, that was back then. This is 2017. This is basically 10 years later. How many more people have the mark? Do you know that employment is impossible? In certain places without an implant. Do you know that? Because of security and technology. And if you want that job, you're going to take that implant. How about that? See, some places with computers, they don't have physical organs. It's bio-identification. Biofeedback mechanisms. Door locks and everything else. Biofeedback. Computer recognition only. Can't crack that, can you? Unless you chop somebody's head off, hand off, or something like that. Hmm? Biometrics is fingerprint. Biofeedback is different. That's what the implant is for. Ah, that takes it to a brand new level, doesn't it? Biofeedback. Most of you have seen the rice grain RFID chips. Do you not know that in 1991, they achieved an implant that would fit through a syringe, right? Not a huge gauge syringe. We're not talking about one of those cow needles, but more like uh, the size of which you give an IV right in the fluid. Mm -hmm. they could, you could have one right now and not know it. Honestly, you could. You really could. That technology existed back then. Which is why on the internet, they don't care if people talk about the RFID chip. But see, us, spiritual people, we shouldn't be interested so much in the technology of RFID. But the conversation about the implant itself. How would, it, how would an implant like that be connected to Lucifer himself? How could the world ever be deceived into worshiping the beast and worshiping the dragon? Can we take a look at that? Let's just hope that we haven't been doing it. We have to a degree. All of us have to a degree. Would you be shocked if I told you that all of us to a degree have worshiped Lucifer? Would you?
Would you be shocked if I were to tell you that in large ways we have compromised our own Christianity? Would you be shocked? Hmm? It makes one sad and sick to their stomach to know that we did. Fighting on the wrong side for a long time. But then you rejoice because you remember the Savior. And you realize you're not dead. And you realize that your heart is not given over to those things of this world. And you say, thank you, Lord Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you. Can we take a look at that, guys? I'm going to bring out, I'm going to bring out something here in Revelation. Also, I'm going to be looking into the, some uh, other parts here. Can I read this? Just for a second. Just a small piece. How about that? Tiny, 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 tiny piece. Just a little piece. Let me find it here. And here we go. You guys ready for this? Just one. Just one. I'm going to read this. Revelation 13, 4. And they worship the dragon. Pardon? They worshiped the dragon. Which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast. Wait a minute. Who is the dragon? It's that old serpent. Called the devil and Satan. What do you mean the world worshiped the, the inhabitants of the earth? Worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast? Huh? How can anyone worship Lucifer right now in this day? Wouldn't you like to know? Huh? I'll tell you how. What is worship? Can somebody define worship? Can you do that? Worship. Isn't that voluntary observance? Worship. Isn't it to esteem something? Lift something up? Isn't that worship? Right? Most people begin to think about the writings in Matthew and some other of the apostles' writings and, and the disciples' writings, and they say, well, that guy who couldn't sell all of what he had and go give it to him, go, get, go, go, I'm sorry, not, not, he said, go, get rid of all you have. I'm going to put it that way and come follow me, Jesus. And the guy said, well, I can't do it. I work very hard for what I have. I just can't give it up. Is there another way? Is what he was saying. Is there another way? At the end of that conversation, Jesus said, you cannot worship two masters. You can't have two masters. You can't serve both God and Mammon. Mammon. What in the world is Mammon? What is that? What is Mammon? It's, a, it's, it's connected to materialism. I'll put it simply. Connected to materialism. There's a deeper meaning behind, behind that entity. Now, for Jesus to name an entity, oh, something is not right. Right? And I, I tend to listen to everything Jesus says, those things that I've read. And so because he speaks the word of God, everything he says, he does so with great purpose. Or he wouldn't say it. Now why in the world did he say you couldn't have two masters, you would love one and hate the other, and so on and so forth. But then he says, then he says, you can't worship both God in Mammon? Who is Mammon? Now, here's what shocked me. Why would that entity be on the same level as God? It's almost like Jesus is saying, you're worshiping one or the other. That's what captures my attention. Right? You're either worshiping God or that thing. Now, this gentleman was not mean-hearted. He was rich. He had stuff. He worked hard for his belongings, but he couldn't part with them. He couldn't forsake all of that to follow Christ. See, that caught my attention too. Not that he had stuff. It's that the stuff had him. The stuff gave him reason not to part with it. Then I began to analyze what type of power is that. Then I saw myself and I said, oh, Lord, you got me again. You're revealing something to me again. Revealing something to me again. You mean to tell me 
that I too am that guy who said I can't follow you because I have too much stuff. That's, that stuff had me and it had my worship over you. It struck me. That was me. Having stuff. Right? Jesus didn't ask him in opportune time either. He said right there on the spot, you go and sell all you have and follow me. And God said, well, I can't do it. Is there another way? I can't even process that. Give away everything? Are you kidding? I can't process that. If somebody came up to us and said, I want you to leave your home and everything else, you didn't know the person. And they said, now I follow the Lord. You give up everything you have and you come follow me. You wouldn't do it either. The first thing you'd probably say is, this person is crazy. I'm not doing that. You're going to have to prove to me that the Lord sent you in the first place. Right? And then what we do? Like when the Holy Spirit tells us to go give this person so-and-so, you'll scratch your head and say, well, that couldn't have been from the Lord. The Lord knows I need that next month. Now, why would he tell me to give that away? What am I saying here? This character, this entity, Mammon, comes from an ancient name. An ancient name. It implies materialism. It implies greed. It implies a control mechanism called money. It implies trade. It implies empowerment by trade. Is what it does. Now this is just, this mammon is one element of the beast. Notice that the dragon has seven heads. Why? Why does Lucifer, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, have seven heads? Why in the world would the dragon have seven heads? Why is a dragon called a dragon? Because in the context of things, a dragon is more than a serpent. A dragon is a flying serpent. A dragon is a great serpent. And a great serpent is a royal serpent. That's why it's called a dragon. Just to make it simple. But that word means something. Flight represents wisdom. Do you know that? Wings and feathers. In the ancient world, they represent wisdom. So when you see something they have carved and it has wings, that means their wisdom they have wisdom. That's why Indians wore the feathered caps. Did you notice that? It means wisdom. But why do they associate feathers, the feathered bird, with the serpent in the first place? You see this with Native Americans. Serpents and birds. Serpents and birds in Egypt. Serpents and birds. You see this all the time. Why? The serpent is a power and a royalty. The feathers are wisdom. It's what it represents. You see, the first one in the Bible that mentioned that is mentioned that had great knowledge and wisdom other than God himself was the challenger of God's laws. The serpent in the garden who has a name. Now the name that serpent has We'll see this in an Enoch study. It's not Satan or the devil or Lucifer. Nor is it Beelzebub. Because those are characteristics. That's like saying, saying the devil is like saying the president. Saying Satan is like saying a Democrat or a Republican. It is a title. It is a category utilized in very specific ways. So when Jesus says Satan or devil, he's telling you something. One is an accuser. One stands in opposition to the word of God. Those names mean something. Beelzebub, it means something. The dragon means something. That would, the dragon would be the complete system. That's why he has seven heads. Right? If you can understand the dragon, you can see the beast. If you can't understand the dragon, how can you see the beast? Think about it. Why would the dragon have seven heads? Those are specifically, right? Because in the beast system, 
Those seven heads? We were told what they were, so let's examine that, shall we? Wouldn't you want to know how the adversary is getting away with what he's getting away with anyway? Why is he so sneaky? Why can't you see him? I tell you, you see him every day. You interact with him every single day. He's so sneaky, you don't know it. You guys ready for this? Flip to Revelation 17 so we can see what they are. Listen. And here's the mind that hath wisdom. 17.9. This is Revelation 17.9. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Right? 11. The beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. 12. The ten horns, which thou sawest are ten kings. So listen what we're dealing with. You guys ready for this? We're about to see it. Those seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, we're given a key here that most people don't mention. It says there are seven kings total. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, when he cometh, he must continue a short space. It says, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, of the seven what? The seven kings, and goeth into perdition. Then it talks about the horns. So what's the difference between the ten kings and the seven kings? Ah. Uh oh, two sets of kings? But the seven are called mountains, right? What is Jerusalem called? Anybody know what Jerusalem called? It, what it's called in truth, biblically? It is called the sanctuary of strength. It is also called the holy mountain. The holy mountain. Not the mountain like one of these mountains of the beast, but the holy mountain. Sanctuary of strength, the holy mountain. What mountain is that? What mountain is Jerusalem called? Mount starts with a Z. Often Mount Zion. Not the physical Mount Zion, but Mount Zion is implied to be Jerusalem. Do you know that? We're not talking about physical places. Right? We're not talking about that. What we're speaking of, and that's in the book of Daniel, by the way, is also in the book of Ezekiel and Isaiah. It's also, you can also see echoes of it in Amos and other books in the Bible. So what we're talking about, and what is a mountain? Is a mountain, a mountain is unmovable, right? The Lord said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could go tell that mountain to go throw itself in the water, and it would. A mountain is a place of strength. A place of strength is unmovable. The dragon has seven heads. Those heads are mountains. The dragon has seven horns. Did you know that? There's a difference between the dragon and the beast. The answer's right here. It's right here. Let's look at the description of the dragon. I'm going to read it to you real quick, okay? Revelation 12.3 scripture fragment having this is talked about there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads did you hear that seven crowns upon his heads a crown does that not imply active recognition or it's active right it's active it has ten horns now let's look at the beast of the earth. Now I sit upon the sand sea and saw a beast rise upon the sea. It's Revelation 13. Well, let's see what this guy looks like. Scripture fragment, verse 2 at the end. And the dragon, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He had, he had seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Upon his heads plural, the name of blasphemy. So what's the difference here? So this beast that came up out of the sea, right? What's the difference between the dragon and him? Seven heads, 
The beast down at the sea has seven heads, ten horns, and upon its horns ten crowns. The dragon has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Did you see the difference? The heads of the dragon are crowned. All right, to make it simple. Right? The heads of the, the horns, the horns of the beast are crowned and not the heads. You see the difference? You guys see that? That's important, don't you think? That's very important. Certainly when you get to Revelation 17, that's worthy of investigation. Now we know in Revelation 17, those 10 kings, you don't know who they are. Why do I say that? Because of Revelation 17, 16. And the 10 horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn it with fire. Right? For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. Right? So they give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Right? They have one mind. And they gave their power and strength unto the beast. They ruled one hour with the beast. Right? Because it says in Revelation 17, 12, and the ten horns were south source of ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. So then one hour of the rule of the beast, these ten kings who are appointed kings give their power unto the beast. Why do they do this? God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. What words are those? The indignation promised in the book of Jeremiah. All right? That's what's happening. But we need to see who the dragon is because the word says... The, the, that people, the world, worshipped the dragon and they didn't just worship the beast, they worshipped the dragon. And my question again, how are we worshipping the dragon? Because the dragon came first, copied himself and gave his power seat and great authority to the beast which is in the earth. The physical manifestation of the dragon is the beast. Are you guys seeing this now? That's the physical manifestation. See, the dragon is spiritual. Can't do anything by himself. All he did was spiritually chase and accuse the offspring of the woman because he went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was after them like he's after you, right? He can't do anything. But he's after them. So what does he do? Because he's after them, he copies, he replicates himself in the earth and possesses it. When it says he gave his power seeking great authority, he is literally possessing what he made in the earth. Are you guys with me? Is that not possession? Huh? If a demon, if a person is possessed, they have the power of that demon, don't they? They have the authority of that demon, don't they? They have the seat of that demon, or they do those things that demon did, and they, they, they can command other demons. That person can, because that demon is in them when they're possessed. So Satan, knowing because he's cast out of heaven, he can't do anything. At the cross, he was cast out of heaven. Because Jesus said so. The prince of the world cometh and he had nothing in me it also says he's cast down because of the cross because of the cross satan is cast down that is this fulfillment but he can't do anything if he could you would have been dead in the beginning so what does he do he replicates himself in the earth slowly building a system what does he do in the end days he gives that system his power his seat and his great authority. He possesses what he created in the earth. And it rules over man. It is the physical nature of the dragon himself. 
Hmm, maybe that's why there's draconian law, all those talking lizards and dragons. Everything dragon, dragon, dragon. He's been setting this up for a long time. Because he knew prophecy too. He didn't know it. But he can never know it to the extent that you'll have it. See, God gives you revelation. God does not give Satan revelation. You may need to know that too. He is very limited. But if you slip over into his territory, you can be ripped to shreds. So don't you think it pays to investigate how the world right now is worshiping the dragon? Because in the earth, if they worship the beast, and it says and they worship the dragon too, then guess what? What is it telling you? That Satan is in fact possessing the kingdoms in this earth. That's why. That's why in Revelation, later on in Revelation, it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's why in the Gospels of Jesus Christ, it says that Satan is the prince of this world. He, it calls him the God. Paul called him the God of this world. And he was speaking in the context of all these man-made nations. So you may not know this, but God will undo his own vineyard. Because he said his vineyard was supposed to bring forth grapes. This is Isaiah 5, but it brought forth wild grapes. See, he's going to change. He's going to purge his vineyard. Because Satan crept his little tingly fingers in there too. Mr. Leviathan himself. The beast of the sea. The sea are the many peoples, nations, tongues and languages of the earth. The beast of the sea, Leviathan. In fact, we read that before, didn't we? Did a scripture reference that in fact, Leviathan is that piercing serpent, the devil. Oh, this might get interesting. You have to know this. No need to fear him. He's been dethroned. Lest you serve him. If you're in his kingdoms, you have everything to worry about. But if you're not, you have nothing to worry about. Christ overcame him. If you be in Christ, you too have overcome him, not by your own power, but by the power of Christ. Also, Satan is a fugitive. How many of you know that? He's a fugitive. He does not hold the title he used to hold. He's a fugitive. The demons ran away from Christ, just like they run away from those who abide in Christ. Satan faced Christ during the temptations because Christ was led into the desert to be tempted by him in the first place. He overcame him. That's when it was proven that Satan had nothing in Christ. He couldn't tempt him. See, if Satan can tempt you, he has something in you. Jesus said, the prince of the world cometh and he had nothing in me. That's when he was about to die. But what you need to find out is, wait a minute, does Satan have an investment in me? Because if he does, his worship is also going to be within you. And if it is, you need to recognize it and do away with it. Wouldn't you say? Don't get scared. Oh, I've done something wrong. No, guess what? You were born into this world. You were children of death and sin. Jesus came. When you said yes to the Lord, you began to abide in him. He brought you into life everlasting. You only have life because of Christ. Before Christ, you were in death. You, yes you. But you were sent here in death that you may find life. How about that? You're going to be proven innocent and not guilty. Oh, I love that part. You can call me guilty all day. All of you can call me guilty. I am guilty as charged. But by the blood of the Lamb. In the end, if I abide in Christ, He will say not guilty. How about that? You can call me guilty. You can lock me up. Do what you want to do. But you're not my issue. Nor do I give you reverence. My mind is stayed upon Christ. You see, I need his approval, not yours. I need him to say not guilty in truth. Not your accusations of flesh. See? Now, if you think that way, and Satan is the accuser of the brethren, you just dethroned him as the accuser of the brethren. He can't do anything. 
He can oppose God's word all he wants. He can mess it up in everybody's mouths. But the Lord departed to us the Holy Spirit. He can give us direct revelation straight from himself. He's dethroned again. Have no fear of him. He's a trickster. He does little magic tricks. That's what he does. He's also a fugitive. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Flee does not mean casually walk away. He is the fleeing serpent. You understand? That's why that was written in the first place. You didn't know how to resist him. If he has nothing in you, he's gone. But he will tempt you in every single way he tempted Christ. Most people don't know that. In all the temptations of Christ, Satan will tempt you too. God won't lead us into temptation like he led Christ into temptation. Because it says Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Right? That's why Jesus said, now I know about this. You pray like this. And then it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why? Because Jesus knew about the temptations. Everything, that's why it says, we don't have a high priest who is not sensitive to our infirmities. That's why it's written that way. Boy, it makes absolute sense when you begin to look into it truthfully. Right? When you listen to the word of God and you're sober in mind in doing so, you hear the truth. Hmm? Satan is dethroned. Right? It's so funny, too, because of all the things I've done in my life. Satan did make me do them. I did them. I did them because I wanted to do them. It didn't matter what the cause was. I did them. Every sin I committed, nobody forced me to do it. I was tempted into doing it. And when you're tempted into doing something, a man can only be tempted and drawn away of his own lust. Of what he desires. The desire to sin was born with me, just like it's born with you. But we are not to become sin itself, but children of God. Because we exercise our desires. In, in the Bible it says that the Lord will give you the desires of your heart, but only after the change. See, before the change, you desire everything outside of the kingdom of God. After the change, you don't desire things of flesh anymore. Nothing of flesh. You don't. You're not sitting there desiring riches and all fixes. That's not what you're desiring. Your desires change. Totally change. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All those things be added to you. Why? Because they won't condemn you then. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you're going to find it. And if you find it, well then, you're going to be given many tools. Before you seek the kingdom of God, before you seek out his righteousness, a tool can destroy you like money. Money is a tool. But prior to your desires being changed, money can lead you straight into death. If it's only a tool, you're not going to worship. How many people do you see worshiping a hammer? How many people would say, well, I can't give you this nail because this nail is important to me. People don't do stuff like that, do they? You don't sit there and look at a nail. Oh, I've got big plans for you. You don't do that. You don't worship the nail, right? That'd be like worshiping a staple. How many of you worship a staple? You won't let anybody touch your staples. How many? How many of you go hide your staples in a lockbox at the bank? Huh? How many do that? You got a vault for your staples? I don't think so. Why? Because it's a tool. Money is too, but you lock that up. Why? Because you're afraid somebody's going to steal it. How many people are afraid somebody's going to come in and steal your staples? Hmm? Huh? Doesn't it seem funny how we worship things and we don't know it? We don't know we do these things, but we do it anyway. Right? Whatever you value the most you're going to lock up because you're afraid instantly somebody else may take it 
So let me put it in this vault and put it behind this picture. And this picture is really not a picture. Let me slide the sheetrock in front of it. So if they hap the sheetrock falls off, they'll see the picture, never discovering the safe, which is not even in that location, but you got to push this little button and the floor comes out. So you start hiding things. And if you get old like I am, you'll hide something and then you can't find it five minutes later. I used to do that a lot. Oh, I'm hiding this. The boys won't get this. One week later, I come back, oh, my Lord, I can't remember where I put that thing. Well, I hit it good this time because I can't find it. You guys see that, though? You see the comparison there? You see it? Now, folks, I'm going to take a break as usual because an interruption has come. I'm going to handle this and see what it is. All right? I'm going to see what I can do. I'm going to be back. Give me, give me some leniency on this. I will come back. Because we need to know if we've been worshiping Lucifer or not. Some people are saying, oops, I, I think I did. Right? I'm smiling right now. Because some people are actually probably, I'm just saying this with the highest of confidence, they're probably saying, oops, I, I, uh, I think I have been. Right? I'll be right back, you all. Right back. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Are you kidding? Um, I, listen, guys, I'm telling you. That was the most ridiculous these things always happen they always do it's funny well they've been happening they've been happening annoyances flies no wonder he's he should be lord of the of the the green flies you guys know what those are don't you flies irritate therefore he is the lord of irritation but we can get beyond that we certainly can okay back to what we were speaking of Worshipping the dragon. How in the world do people worship the dragon? Did we set a standard? Guys, are you with me? Now, I'm looking at the chat room. Is everybody, are you following me according to the word of God? Are you following me here? Are you seeing something? Now, we speak of this all the time, but are you seeing something now? Right? That this guy built a system in the world over the span of years... And when it is complete, or at a certain level, he is possessing it. Which is why Christ called him what he called him. Right? Now, now that we know that, or now that we can, hopefully we can see that, and I really do hope that you understand it. And of course, I I'm always encourage people to go back to your word and read it for yourselves. Right, don't take my word for it because it's not my word I'm not the authority on God's word God is he's the authority right he's the authority he gives understand I can't give you understanding the father does all right knowing that he made this system now there are verses in the Bible lots of verses that imply that this world is not what we thought it was correct the world is not what we think it is. Right? And that we were truly in the darkness. Everybody has been a part of the darkness. And that's why in Romans 13, 12, says, Cast off the unfruitful works of darkness. This is so funny. The works of light and righteousness yield perfect fruits every single time. The works of darkness are unfruitful. Right? Not my words. These were recommendations that were given to the apostles via the Holy Spirit to give to the people. Darkness is unfruitful. Ephesians 5.11, Romans 13.12. Right? God called us out of the darkness, First Peter 2.9, into the marvelous light. Right? Darkness is unfruitful. These are scriptures in the Bible. Right? No wonder the Lord says, when he's talking in the book of Luke and he's speaking about the seed sown into the earth, that the one who accepts his word and keeps it, and that word develops with patience, brings forth perfect fruit. But those who don't bring no fruit to perfection. So then a perfect fruit... Right? Let me give you an example of a perfect fruit. Right? Can I give you this example? If you have an apple 
and a worm ate through it. Is that a perfect fruit? Is it perfect? Yes or no? Is that a perfect fruit? If you have an apple and a worm ate through it, is it a perfect fruit? See, now, many people are saying the answer I thought you would say, which is zero. Everybody says zero. I'll set you up for failure. You know what the truth is? It is a perfect fruit. It's just that a worm had dinner off of that fruit. An imperfect fruit is when you hold something that looks like a brownie, but it was supposed to be an apple. It's not a perfect fruit. So then a perfect fruit is a fruit that came out to be what the seed was. You see that? Did, can everybody see that? Can you see that? An apple is a perfect fruit. Why? Because it was after its kind. And that's why. Right? So a perfect fruit is in fact a fruit. But if you pick an apple tree and pull off a brownie, something is wrong. That's not a perfect fruit. That's called unfruitful. Because the seed produced the wrong thing. That tree yielded something it shouldn't have. Correct? Which is no fruit at all. So there's only one type of fruit. A perfected fruit. A perfected fruit is not perfect by the way you look at it. Because every apple is not shaped the same. Right? Every apple is different in volume. Correct? But it is a perfect fruit. Why is it a perfect fruit? Because it's an apple. If it came from an apple tree, if an apple grew from a grapevine, I can assure you, that is not a perfect fruit. It can be just like the one from the apple tree. But it is not supposed to be an apple. You see? I mean, you know why I use that examples, guys? Because of the way we think. The way we think, that's why. We look at perfect fruit as though you have 12 apples, right? And one of the apples is imperfect. Maybe it, the stem is canted, is, is five degrees off. Maybe it's flattened on one side. No, it's a fruit. We do this with each other too. Because people say, well, I can't be perfect. You mean to tell me you can't be what God intended you to be? That's what you're saying. With Christ, Perfection happens. Can you see that? See, I get excited about that because with our mental minds, the way we have been taught about something being perfect, we never considered unfruitful. Right? You were born to be a human being. You're not a giraffe. If you were a giraffe, something went horribly wrong. You're not after your kind. That makes you an abomination. Because somebody mingled something with you. Right? So then, do you, are you guys seeing that? That's why darkness is unfruitful, the word says. It does not yield after its... It, it, darkness yields nothing but darkness. Darkness is not being fruitful. To be fruitful means a seed is planted. And the yield of that thing... Is that fruit it, it doesn't matter the shape you know uh, some of the some of the best grapes have dents in them I didn't make them imperfect right a little layer gets in there beyond the skin of the grape right kind of seasons it somehow ages a little different tastes better sweeter correct same grape where the skin is not broken different ripeness it's a little sour correct Right? Strawberries come in different sizes. Just because one of them has a critter in it does not make that fruit imperfect. That means that's a perfect fruit with a critter in it. Right? Our ideology of perfection we have taken from the world. See, to be perfect in the world, you must have no flaws according to the world. To be perfect with the Lord, you must be as he intended you to be, which is possible through Christ. Is it possible for you to be perfect? You better believe it. That's why the world tells you you can never be perfect. Why would you trust what the world says when God said you can be through him? 
That'd be like somebody saying, well, I can't keep all the commandments. Well, the Bible says with Christ, we are the keepers of the commandments. How can you keep the commandments? Because you reside within the blood of the Lamb. And to do that, you must have repented. And to repent means you are washed clean. You are flawless because of the blood of the Lamb only. See, when you're covered by the blood of the Lamb, you are in Christ. When you are in Christ, you share the mind of Christ. When you share the mind of Christ, you have no desire to sin. When you have no desire to sin, you start loving one another. When you have given up your own life for the sake of the life, the, the, the servitude toward your father, guess what? You're no longer in competition with anybody because you want nothing of yourself. You want everything for everybody else. Guess what that makes you? Covered by the blood of the Lamb in truth. That makes you the righteousness of Christ who loved everybody so much he agreed with his Father and did not back away from the cross although he felt the pain of it, the fear of it, and everything else. But he did say, nevertheless, thy will be done. Now with that small definition, and if you can analyze that mindset about fruit being perfect, right? Being yielded after its kind, right? God calls that good, doesn't he? Read that in Genesis, right? He created all these things and all, oh, I said, God said it was good, right? He said it was good. Even the thorns, he said it was good. The poison ivy, he said it was good. How can poison ivy be good? How can a plant that yields nothing for us that we know about be good? It is to God because he had purpose behind it. It is not about how we see things with our human eyes. That is our mistake. You're a child of the king. You have an ability to have the mind of Christ, which is to have the spirit of Christ. It is time that we see things through spiritual eyes because that is the truth. And what you see with your physical eye is the illusion. It is deception. If you lead your life by those things you can see with your eye, you are deceived because you'll trust in those things you see with the eye. See, the only problem with that is everything you see with your eye was created. God governs creation. Man governs his own creations. Therefore, they are subject to change without notice based upon their creators. If I build a bowl of cereal, I built it. I know you would say, well, no, you don't build it. You pour it in there and you add milk. No, that's a monumental feat to fix a bowl of cereal. I built it. I can also eat it up and devour it. I can go dump it out if I want to. Can you imagine a kid coming in seeing that good bowl of cereal, their favorite cereal? They blink their eye and I dumped it in the sink. That kid would cry. Why? Because they trusted and what they saw with their eyes. Somehow they thought it was for them, not knowing the truth. The truth was, the milk was bad when I poured it in there. It looked good, but it wasn't good, so I dumped it out. And the child's heart is broken because they wanted that cereal. Right? You guys see that? Because what we're doing, the question, the initial question is, have we been serving? Have we been worshiping the dragon? Here it is, right between the eyes. Now, this is where people have a problem. Because if I said, how many of you worship Hollywood? You would say, oh, no, 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 no. But you would move heaven and earth to see your favorite show. Hmm, interesting. If I said, how many of you worship actors? You'd, oh, no, I don't worship them. But you would change your schedule to go see a movie made from those same actors in Hollywood. So what I'm saying is that you will partake of the fruit of darkness, but you won't call it darkness. Uh oh, you see that? Don't try to get out of it. We're all guilty of it. If you so much, listen to me, if you so much and stop your whole schedule to watch somebody's speech, if you kick your kids aside to hear me, what's the difference? Hmm? If you ignore your family to come to COT, what is the difference? Huh? What's the difference? Because you're worshiping something made with hands. That's precisely what God said, don't do. 
Now, if God said don't worship idols, an idol being something made of mankind, I know they expanded the definition. But listen, an idol is something made of mankind. If you remove your first work to do another work, you just messed up. You're incomplete. Oh, see, now that's a, see, that's one of those things where, wait a minute, because a minister told me that you should just make time to do so and so. I try, but you better take care if the charity starts at home. Uh oh, how can you defy the word of God to keep the word of God? You can't do that. Right? That would almost be like breaking one covenant to enter into a new one. You can't do that. Why do you think Jesus did that for us? That would be like some of you. Let me tell you something truthful, right? I See, I was strange when I was young, certainly when it came to tithing. Oh, I was just strange. I made people mad. I remember when I was a kid, and I said, well, if you have a bill, didn't they already render the service for what you have before you pay, right? Older people say, yes, yes, yes. So how can you give the money that's due to them, to God? Isn't that stealing and not meeting an obligation to give to another organization? Well, it's more complicated than that. See, I have a simple mind. How can it be more complicated than that? Then sure enough, when you go back in the word of God, what does it say? Oh, no man, no money. Give 10% of your increase. Your increase is above and beyond what you owe. But he got them out of debt first. He said, get out of debt first. He spoke in the book of Malachi. I used to hear that in church all the time. Somebody would stand up and say, well, a man robbed God. And then when you go back and read the book, it says to the priesthood. The priests can rob God they can because they receive on behalf of God how can you rob them are you receiving on behalf of God see the Lord gave us specifics didn't he and if you don't if here's the thing when we don't do those things what do we find ourselves in bondage that's what we find ourselves in bond, a perpetual bondage and we say now what in the world what in the world? Well, the Lord was clear. What do you think God for Jesus of Nazareth? Because in truth, we've lost a lot of knowledge due to popularity. See, at a time, people were worried about being blessed. How can they get more money? Come to church, you'll get more money. Stand up. All those who have a $50 bill, you'll be blessed with 5000 stuff like that. Right? When we know that woman with the alabaster box gave more than all everybody did unto the Lord altogether. Why? Because she was poor and that's all she had. So that's giving of yourself. She did, listen, she did so in honesty. It was hers. She didn't owe that to anybody. The disciples standing around, the people following, well, you could have sold that and we could have had more money. That's not what she did. She knew what it was worth. And that's what she had a value. And what she had a value she granted that unto her servitude to the Lord. She was very thankful. People missed that part. That woman was thankful. Do you understand me? She was so thankful that the value of something no longer held a it didn't it didn't even come beside her thankfulness unto Christ. Tears of strength. She was thankful. She understood. That was called truth. God loves a cheerful giver, doesn't he? That's what it says. You know how many people give and they're not cheerful. They act like they are because they want something in return. God says he loves a cheerful giver. Not a cheerful person cheerful because they think they're going to be blessed because they gave. We used to do those things, didn't we? Give because we thought we would be blessed. I wonder how many people would just give for the sake of giving, looking for nothing in return. And when they do so, they do unto the Lord, and because they're thankful unto them. And they're looking for nothing back from him. They just want to say, thank you, Lord.
I'll tell you, those people are the ones who understand the cross. Jesus died for us, and it is impossible for us to pay him back. I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes that thought is on my mind so much. The noise of the world goes totally away. All situations and everything are gone because nothing can stand itself beside that cross and what Jesus did. Not my circumstances, not my health, not anything. No problem, no person can ever get beside that because all I have to do is really think of that and my heart is full of thanks for what he did and for what he did alone. And that gives me so much strength. Because Jesus died for me. And I know in my heart he shouldn't have, but he did so anyway. I say he shouldn't have because I understand who I am. Do you understand who you are? You have people out there now, well, Jesus should have died for me. I'm worth it. No, you're not. You're not worth it. You're not worth it. You're prone to the same things we are. You want to know the truth? We have been worshiping Lucifer. Because all of us have been involved in his systems. And each and every one of us judged a person because they didn't have the viewpoint we had concerning Lucifer's kingdoms. Take that one to the bank. They didn't stand on our crooked side, so we judged them because of something in the kingdoms of this world. Do men worship the kingdoms of this world? Yes, they do. Yeah, they do. I'm going to put it to you this way. Because I've been there too. My loyalty to the nation was at one point stronger than my loyalty to any human being out there. I was proud of an oath, serious about a vow, and I kept it not knowing what it truly entailed. I fought on behalf of an ideology of men and I didn't care how it changed. It only mattered that it was from the very place of which I was under oath and loyal to. I would die for the country at one point and do so proudly without question. It began to change. You see, the word of God messed that all up. He did. The word of God just messed it up. It messed it up. I said, oh, no, Lord, wait a minute. I am stuck because how do I? I'm stuck. And the Lord gave me something. Something simple. What you do unto the least of these, you've done unto me. The least of these, who are they? Those who don't believe yet. Those who are in the world still sitting on the wrong side, occupying in different countries. The fact is, I didn't know who God called. So guess what I began to do? I couldn't fight for a piece of soil. But I could fight for my brother and my sister. And combat does not stop on the battlefield. But I decided to enter into combat every day of my life it's necessary for the sakes of my brothers and sisters and we're shot at often by the fiery darts of the enemy aren't we and let the redeemed say so what I'm not here to complain at the dart he just fired at me nor am I here to run from the darts he may throw at me I'm here to make sure my brother and sister do not die of the darts shot at them. So it's okay for me to walk around with darts sticking in me. Because my loyalty is for my brothers and sisters. And I don't know who's been called to the kingdom. Thus, I must love my enemy as myself. Because as it turns out, some of your worst enemies will enter in with you in the kingdom of heaven. You don't know who they are. But the Lord is qualifying a lot of people through the sinful life they live. My goodness. See, that doesn't even sound clean, does it? 
Your sinful life qualified you in many ways. Look at Paul. He didn't live a goody two-shoes life. He didn't. He was ruthless. Peter was a cussing fisherman. His mouth was so rotten. Didn't he curse when he denied Christ? I don't know any blankety blank Christ. Didn't he deny it? Peter, the one who recognized Christ and Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church. The recognition of Jesus Christ from the Father. And it's so funny because even in that statement, that rock, listen to what he said. Peter, who do men say that I am? Who do you say I am? You are the Christ. Jesus' flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven upon that rock, I'm going to build my church. What rock is that? The rock, ladies and gentlemen, is the recognition of Christ directly from God. So then the only way you're going to know Christ is from God, which means you're part of his church. And it's a rock that can never be moved. Why? Because God reveals this to his own. Satan can't do anything with that. Nothing. It is that rock, that solid foundation of that recognition of Christ that the church is. And the church belongs to Christ. Even after that episode, Peter still denied him. And he was not cast away. Yet we look at each other. If we lived, if Peter were alive right now, and we heard him deny Christ, we would say, oh, he's full of darkness. He's this, he's that, not even knowing what we're saying. We're but infants, and we do love to judge. Why? Because that's what the world does. They judge, they look for proof, and they fry people. That's, that's their modus operandi. They like to rebel. See, in the world, if somebody says, well, that's not permitted, everybody jumps on board and says, well, we're going to prove to you how it is permitted. The world is rebellion. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever been rebellious? Hmm? Because if you say you have not, then you have obeyed every word of Christ. Did you obey every word of Christ? Because if you have not, you've been rebellious. Did you not wait upon the Lord for your deliverance or did you deliver yourself from time to time? Because if so, you were rebellious. You refused to wait upon the Lord. Sure, we compensate by saying, well, I just, you know, I just, I don't know what happened. I lost faith. Well, that's still rebellion. In the Bible, it says the prince, the prince of the air works in the children of disobedience. To be in rebellion is not to obey God. Do not obey God is exactly what we were. The first thing we need to admit to ourselves is that we were the workers of iniquity. You don't believe that, do you? Why did God say so? Why did Jesus say that? Why did he reveal that we were? Hmm? He said you were once enemies of God. Oh, see, that's heavy, isn't it? Can you imagine God saying that you were his enemy? If you came to Christ, you were once his enemy through disobedience and rebellion. Do you know how many people deny that? No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. If you're in the flesh, you were. How about that? It's funny. We like to call out other people's darkness. And we won't admit our own. Maybe that's why it was given to the apostles and said, Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Hmm. Now, if we were in darkness and not in the light, then we were within the kingdoms of who? Satan. And if we were in the kingdoms of Satan, educated in certain principles of the kingdoms of Satan, we had fun when we were young. We got in trouble. 
We had guilt, conviction. The Lord called us. He broke down our lives right in front of our faces. But did he break down your life, folks? You're gonna, you might laugh at this. How many of you know, I'm setting you up for failure. How many of you know that your life literally was ripped apart right before your eyes? And then you cried out for Christ in truth because you were desperate. Because all of what you trusted in and all of what you had began to vanish, decay, blow up, and everything else. Before you came to Christ. Like we were pressed into a corner. How many went through that? And you felt great loss. How many had a loss before they came to Christ? How many? Yeah, people are saying, amen, me, number one, and I'm saying you guys are for failure. You think you had great losses, don't you? Huh? Well, let me put it to you this way. According to Scripture, we were children of darkness, not light. According to Scripture, we were the ones lurking in the shadows. According to Scripture, God called us out of the darkness. So that means we had things in darkness. When God brought us to the light, he stripped us of things and idols of darkness. And we did cry over them, didn't we? You cried and your heart was broken because you lost something in darkness. I'm not talking about human beings. I'm talking about stuff. Relationships. The Lord stripped you of dark things and you rebelled against them saying, I want it. I don't want to lose that. Some of you had things you couldn't afford. And you killed yourself trying to keep it. And you don't even know why. Something marvelous happened, though, because when you lost it, you said, huh, well, I don't have that burden anymore. Many things happen like that. Whose hand was that? That was the Lord stripping us from us serving and worshiping Lucifer. Because to worship the dragon, I didn't mean to say Lucifer. It says the world worshiped the dragon, not specifically Satan. The dragon being his architecture his kingdom you see how that works the dragon is a set of kingdoms we did worship the idea of the perfect kingdom in earth that had nothing to do with God with us having everything that is worshiping the dragon we too worship the dragon but God called us out of darkness into the marvelous light first Peter 2 9 I love it I mean, he really called us out of darkness. Without that call, we would have died. We were called out of the darkness. Do you hear what I'm saying? You didn't just automatically choose to go to Christ out of the darkness. No, no. You were called out of the darkness. Which means if he didn't call you out of the darkness, you could have ended up being rich with no soul. You could have ended up being one of the archetypes in these worldly systems, trapped forever. Did we worship the dragon? You better believe it. And when we were stripped of those things, of these kingdoms in this earth, we fought tooth and nail to keep them, didn't we? We fought. We did not want them taken away. Who do we fight? Because God was removing that from our lives. We saw it as a curse, but in fact it was a blessing and the beginning of deliverance. Some of us right now are fighting to keep things God never gave us.